Dobry jutro. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Um, my name is John Hamry. I'm the president at CSIS. Uh, when we have public events, uh, we always start with a little safety announcement. I'm responsible for all of you. So if anything happens, we'll hear a voice that will say, please leave. And then I would ask you to follow me. These exits are right behind us. Uh, we'll take This one's closest to the stairs. It'll take us down to the street. We'll make two left-hand turns. Uh, we'll go across to National Geographic. They've got a great show on right now called the Tomb of the Holy Sepulchre. I'll buy tickets. Everybody can go. We'll have a good time. Nothing's going to happen, but I want you to know we want to be prepared just in case. Uh, you know, it's a real pleasure uh, and an, a kind of a unique pleasure to welcome uh, Ms. Subchak to this event. I don't, I was just, we were just talking. I, I've, in my 18 years at CSS, I've never had a chance to host uh, a candidate for the presidency of another country. Okay, this is new for me. Uh, and we're a bipartisan think tank, so I have to also extend an invitation to President Putin in case he wants to come. Okay? I doubt he will take me up on the offer, but I'm delighted that Ms. Subchuk can be here. Uh, and I'm especially happy that you can be here to have a discussion with all of us uh, about Russia you know, we, to be candid, we are in a, um, we're in a very negative spot on how we think about and talk about Russia. I mean, it is, it's, a, it's a byproduct of many little things. It's very scratchy these days, very scratchy these days. Uh, and we tend to, we've just kind of picked up our old, we looked around the closet and we found our old Cold War glasses and we put them on, you know, and we're looking at things now that same way. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a healthy environment for either of us. We're reinforcing uh, a lot of stereotypes that may or may not be relevant for the time we're in. That's not to discount or minimize the seriousness of the issues that may divide us, but we ought to be talking openly and more constructively with each other about what they mean and where it's going. And I think we're going to get at that this morning. And so I'm, I really am delighted that you could come. I say this is a very unusual opportunity for us, it's a very un, unusual opportunity for me personally, but I'm delighted that you've come. And I want to say thank you for that. I'm going to turn to Dr. Oliker, who is going to formally introduce you, uh, and then we'll get this program going. So please, all of you, come on. Thank you. So I'm going to be extremely brief because I think that Ksenia Sobchak really does not need uh, an introduction. She is the candidate for the presidency of the Russian Federation of the Civil Initiative Party. Uh, she has been um, a, uh, a journalist in Russia uh, and has had a very notable career in that field with uh, key interviews and reporting that has attracted global attention. And uh, she made the decision to run for the presidency of her country. And I think we are all very eager to hear what she has to say. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Ms. Sapchuk, please. Thank you very much for coming here and for the invitation. Uh, first of all, I want to excuse myself if my English would be a little bit rusty, you know, I don't have so much practice now. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try uh, to do it in the right way. So I'm uh, writing my presidential campaign now, but I still came here for a couple of days because I really think that the uh, relations between our countries are very important, and this is something to talk about, trying to rule them out, and to find solutions for both of our countries. So first I will begin uh, with sharing my opinions on the situation in Russia, and then uh, I hope you will have questions and we can talk with each other on all those issues. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here today to present my vision of the future of Russia to such a distinguished audience. The so-called Kremlin report issued last week is an excellent starting point for such a discussion since it pencils a strategy towards Russia, a massive alienation of its elite, a cut of all possible contacts with the Russians except for the critical ones, almost a boycott. 
I share your deep concern about Russia's behavior and foreign policy that vigorously revived the worst memories of the Cold War. You may know that in Russia a lot of people who are as much unhappy with what is going on as I am, adopt a similar individual strategy. Some prefer not to meddle in politics at all, others immigrate from Russia. What I do not share, though, is a strategy of oblivion or retreat in the safety of private life. Because private life is not safe anymore, nor could anyone remain untouched and untamed when almost every day we have to make a difficult ethic and moral choices, as the one if to go to the polls on the March 18th or to boycott the election. This is why I go and chose my own way. For myself, I have chosen a strategy of action. It is a very simple strategy, and you all know it if you happen to take metro here, for example, in Washington area. Remember, there is a public ad on security. If you see something, say something. So this is actually what I think I will be doing. This is it. I see something in Russia, and I will say something in Russia. And I'll tell you now what it is. What I see is a country that looks by no means normal. There is no rule of law in Russia. The national parliament, the state Duma, obediently passes retroactive and ad hominem laws that benefit only a bunch of people close to President Putin. Russia's economy is wildly controlled by the state. Public service has become the most profitable kind of business. These days, Russia is a society of individuals on the one hand and the state on the other hand, with a yawning emptiness between them. What is striking is a phenomenal lack of trust between people. There is no solidarity and collective actions, probably except for the volunteer movement and charity, are deeply compromised. Russia is a country of atomized citizens uh, confronted by monolithic elite that pirates national wealth. Against it, there is a competition torn, distrustful, and unfriendly Russian opposition, unfortunately. The weaknesses of Russia's society now emerge as a fertile soul for conservative ideology. Why did the authoritarian rule relapse in Russia? I can name at least two reasons why that happened. First, Russia is not an exception here, and we must all understand that. A sort of nostalgia for paternalistic state is common for all post-Soviet states. Populism is on the rise in Poland, in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, in Belarus. Although these countries are all different, what is common about their rulers is that they all seek to restore some mythical full sovereignty through protection against external threats. These people are masters of demagogy and second to none in inventing imaginary external threats. For the Kremlin, it is the Washington Opcom, as they call it, that allegedly mastermind campaign against Russia in the mass media, in the International Olympic Committee and elsewhere. For official Poland, the main enemy is Brussels, which is in reality a feeding hand for the Poles. For Budapest, the major threat comes from the American philanthropist George Soros, who dared to establish and sponsor one of the best liberal universities in the world. Public support, which these politicians enjoy, stems from the persistence of post-communist mentality and disillusionment with liberal democracy. Another reason is immigration. Young, active, fearless people who seek a better life simply leave their home countries. They don't want to fight. A second reason is Russia, and it's specific. The reforms of the 90s, contrary to the expectations of their architects, failed to create a class of responsible owners. In Russia, the largest assets simply changed ownership or were leased out to a retinue of the president, to the people from his close circle. If you do not know the names, look into the Kremlin report. They are all named there. Conversely, power yields money. As a result, bureaucrats turn businessmen and readily harness the law to protect their wealth and interests. 
Unfortunately, Russia's entrepreneurial class is largely not a sponsor of change. So recovery from authoritarianism now looks for Russia as complicated as post-communist transformation loomed at the start of Gorbachev's perestroika. Russia is a European country. It has been greatly involved in the European politics since the 16th century. A century ago, it became an important economic partner of European states and one of the main destinations for European capital and technologies. Like Europe, Russia has suffered from totalitarian ideologies. More than two decades ago, it embraced European liberal ideas. As I said earlier, it quickly rolled back to strong rule. I believe we could have avoided it if Russia were not rejected by the European Union. Unfortunately, the Europeans have not overcome its instinctive fear of Russia and never invited my country to join its great project of a European Union. The Russian elite since the collapse of the Soviet Union has remained on the sideline of major global integration processes and has felt largely marginalized. Eastern Europe has achieved much greater success not because they are better Europeans than Russians, but because they became a part of European Union, the most powerful force behind democratic transformation. There are reasons deep enough to account for the failure of Russia to build the genuine democracy and the rule of law. But I know for sure that the advent of the rule of law in Russia is not an impossible project, but only one thing that remains to be accomplished. I'm convinced it has to be done in an evolutionary and peaceful, not revolutionary way. I see clear evidence we can achieve it. People in Russia, not all of course, but many enough, are deeply unhappy with the current course of events, notably with the economic condition. Since 2008, Russia's economy is de facto stagnating. The combined GDP growth for the last 10 years is about 5% only, while the real disposable incomes fell again in 2017 for the fourth consecutive year. The government promised a steady economic recovery, creation of millions of new well-paid jobs, and fight against mismanagement and corruption. It failed to deliver. I realize that economic hardships will not shake the political system in Russia. Let's be pragmatic. People's well-being is still considerably better than it was 10 or 15 years ago, and that's a fact. Moreover, propaganda works out well. People daunted by ghostly threats simply do not ask for more. We have to wait for another six years to see the people becoming sensitive to economic conditions. Well, unlike Putin, I can't wait. The Russians, uh, the Russians are generally unaware that Russia is in effect hijacked by the ruling gang. The majority of the Russian citizens still believe, as the old Russian wording says, that the Tsar is good but the boyars are bad. But there is a minority which I pretend to speak up for who is tired with Putin, corruption and war. The number of dissidents is growing and it's growing fast. The Kremlin tries to use what we call in Russia spiritual temples to consolidate the society, mostly against those who oppose the incumbent regime. It praises falsified history, glorifies the country's past, propagates religious irresistance. The most primitive and aggressive the new ideology becomes, the bigger is the fatigue. But 2024 is imminent, and we should emerge strong and well prepared for the appointment. I believe we should develop a new vision of Russia. Why? Because basic liberal concepts such as democracy, liberal, liberalism, rule of law, were deeply discredited in the 90s in our country. For many people, democracy and liberal market economy are equal to catastrophic impoverishment and enrichment of the few. All these ideas were so intensively misinterpreted and defamed by the ruling elite that the new generation of Russian liberals have to elaborate an entirely new vision, one that will be promising and yet attractive. The problem is that we have to do it together, bringing in people both from the left and the right of the political spectrum.
To do this, we need diversity and multitude. As I'm running out of time, so I will focus more on my strategy and tactics. To change my country in a non-revolutionary way, I'm against vetting for public officials or property freezing or confiscations in my country. I believe that democratic accountability, freedom of the press, and the genuine rule of law will secure public interest better than any repression or abuses. I want a diverse but internally pacified Russia, united by the vision of the future, nor by the hatred towards its past. This is how I see the transition, as a responsible citizen of my country. This new Russia should possess all necessary checks and balances against revival of authoritarian rule. These restraints must be both internal and external. I stand for diminishing, as greatly as possible, the powers of the president. The only way to achieve it is to transform Russia into a parliamentary republic and to empower the independent judiciary and the responsible legislatory. Moreover, I believe that a country like Russia cannot become democratic and free unless it's governed by all its parts and regions. We need to come back to our federal roots. On the other hand, I think that Russian liberal democracy has little chances to flourish without not only strong moral support from European, but without a deeper integration into Euro-Atlantic realm. Russia has to stop its confrontation with the European Court of Human Rights. It needs to harmonize its legal norms with the European Equis Communautaire. Russia should fully adhere to the UN Convention Against Corruption and join the International Criminal Court. Maybe it's too early to look into the possible co consequences of Brexit, but I believe that if it creates a multi-speed Europe with some states incorporated into the European space, but not being formally EU members, it would be the best option for Russia to seek association with Europe through a new generation of treaties. And to finalize, I would like to address the issue of how should the tactics of the Russian opposition movement look like these days. I'm running for presidency, being fully aware that on the March 18th, my chances to win are very slim. But my major aim is to provide the Russian dissidents with a voice that may help us to prepare to 2024. To, uh, in 2024, Russia will face a crucial point in its history, a choice between large-scale democratization and the restoration of a lifelong perpetual rule. We should arrive as a diverse but consolidated movement that consists of many in which the multitude of like-minded individuals should be valued much more than any of their leaders. These days, the Russian opposition is fragmented and ran by personal ambitions and egos. Propaganda doctors in Russia like to say there is no alternative to Putin. I want to change this. And that is how I will spend the coming six years in explaining people what is going on, in encouraging them to fight. Together, will all who are ready to cooperate, I will work on a new vision for Russia, a new outline of political, economic, and social reforms. In order to crash authoritarianism in Russia, we need to breach conflicts inside the Russian opposition, to elaborate a proper agenda for Russia's future, and to engage all the people who are concerned about Russia's future. I hope my presidential campaign, however limited, will be a great leap for Russia's democracy. Thank you very much for your attention, and now I'm open for the discussion and for your questions. Thank you. So I think um, we're, before I turn to all of you, um, I get to ask a few questions and um, have a bit of a conversation with Ms. Subchak. Please do be patient. We do have time for some audience uh, questions. So thank you so much. That was, um, I mean, you lay out a picture of Russia as it is and Russia as it could be, which is, uh, you know, which, which is very hopeful in its way. Um, but I do have to say, uh, you, if you're running um, 
you know, ideally for the presidency, not so ideally for the role of the person who's going to unite the opposition. I do have to ask you why you're here just over a month before the election. Um, why make this visit to the United States? Well, I think it's very important because uh, we see that our relations are now at the lowest point. I mean, we should understand that even at the Cold War times about which we're speaking, uh, most of the time comparing like how it was and how bad it is now, even in, uh, during the Cold War, uh, you didn't have that sanctions that we have now. Uh, we all remember Jackson's and Vanek uh, law, but that was it. So we can say that the situation now is even worse than it was before. And I think my goal is also to speak to people here, to meet, uh, and I'm going to have many meetings with people in administration who are ruling all those kind of sanction lists and things like this. To, to be open, to say that Russia is not Putin, that one thing is bad relations now, but Russia is a huge country with big economy, with uh, you know, a nuclear weapon, and it's not a good way of communication like we do it now. So I want to be a kind of a, of a first bridge between our countries and to show even uh, during my presidential campaign that this issue is very important to me and uh, to find some solutions, some links with each other through which we can little by little become, you know, uh, create a better situation for both of our countries. It's not an easy way, it's a long way, but we should start with something. So you've said, um, you talked um, quite a bit about this candidacy setting the stage for the future. Um, and you just spoke about spending the next six years sort of build, bridging the conflicts within the opposition, trying to, trying to build that up. Um, how, how does that work? And how does this candidacy actually set the stage for it? I mean, is that not something you could do without running for president? Is that something that somebody who has run for president as a, as a sanctioned, accepted candidate can even do? Will the opposition accept you under those conditions? Yes, of course. Uh, we should understand one th very specific thing about Russia, that uh, uh, we have authoritarian rule now. And the elections that are held in Russia are also very specific. So uh, the candidates, uh, some of the candidates were not uh, admitted to take part in the elections, for the example. Others are bullied all the time. So presidential campaign becomes uh, the most visible political act. And that's why it's so important for a start of, uh, of a dialogue with people and uh, for the start of saying out loud some of the things which you cannot say in your real time because you will never let uh, go on TV because all the federal channels are controlled by government. So actually uh, the absurd of the situation that it's only presidential elections which become a point where you can raise up your voice. That is a chance that I'm taking because my goal, of course, it's not presidential elections in themselves. I'm quite realistic that, like in Casino, Casino always wins. Russian elections, Putin always wins. That's like, <laughs> there's no doubt in that. But the absurdity to come to the parliament of Russia, you have to go first to the presidential elections because when there will be elections for parliament, no one will show you on TV. You can only be marginalized and be on the streets. So now when the, all the world is watching and the authorities are really interested in uh, creating a transparent atmosphere of the elections, it's the only chance to have your voice being heard to millions of Russians who do not have internet, who are not watching news on, uh, on digital platforms and are only watching federal TV. And there are millions of people like that. And this is actually a big problem for all of us, that young people in Russia, they don't want this rule, they're all connected, they all know the situation, but the majority is very conservative, big Russian population who live not in huge cities, 
who do not have access to information. So my educational goal is to go out and to say the truth first time on Russian TV for many years. So you're planning to run for the Duma next? Yes, I've already told uh, mm -hmm. to my audience that this is my plan, mm -hmm. first to go to presidential elections, then creating some platform, uh, some movement mm -hmm. on the basis of the party from mm -hmm. which I'm now going to okay. the elections, uh, or an independent, so I, I, we will decide in the process, but to go to the parliament with a big force and then to the next presidential election. So the other thing you've spoken of is that you don't want to see a revolution. You want, as it were, evolutionary change. But you want some pretty revolutionary changes to come out of that evolutionary change. Um, do you have any historical examples that you would like, you see yourself as emulating in this? How do you see Russia getting from where it is now, which is a fairly bleak picture that you've painted, to the rather more optimistic uh, picture of the Russia that could be that you've also described for us? Yes, of course. Uh, I, I say a number of times that I know examples of the overturning elections when people came, voted, and the vote they did was not the one which all the politologists forecasted. I mean, that was something uh, new and revolutionary. And this uh, made a change it, it itself. But why I don't agree with, uh, for example, other oppositional leaders mm -hmm. on the boycott? Right. Because boycott, I, I don't know a single example when people stayed at home and something changed. So this is an absurd idea in itself. But giving you an example, uh, for United example, States. Sorry? The United States is an ex the US, last US election is an excellent example of people staying at home and things changing. No, no. <laughs> no. People stayed at home and things changed, you know how. I mean, I don't want to mess up again in American relations, you know. Just saying. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that kind of person, but look, mm -hmm. this is actually a good example of how things. Um, how to say diplomatically, okay, I studied in international relations, could be different, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> this, is, this is a good metaphorical point. So, yes, mm -hmm. what you are saying is actually gives me even more, uh, more arguments okay. that, yes, if a situation could change, it only could change this way, yeah. Uh, so, but to give you mm -hmm. another examples, for example, referendum on Pinochet. Okay. We all remember how it all started. I mean, no one believed the opposition uh, in Chile could, uh, you know, win a referendum like that. And the referendum was made because Pinochet was quite sure he will stay there. But what came out, we all know. So this is an example how people went out on the streets and really did it their own way. The same happened with Indira Gandhi, as you remember, on, uh, on the last uh, elections with her. So there are examples in the world when people went and voted and it really dramatically changed the picture. So I don't think this is what will happen now in Russia. But if we will show millions of people who are against, this will be a huge lesson for the powers. They will start this evolutionary pr uh, uh, process because they will know if they won't let those people go and take their power in parliament, in some uh, lesser than presidential institutions, then all of them will be pushed out on the street. And this is something our government really afraid of. So they have a bad choice. They have a street choice of protests, or they have a legislatory evolutionary choice. So I am having this idea less radical for them, and that's why I think it's more acceptable, you know, to, mm -hmm. to unite people around this evolutionary idea. And if they don't go for the evolutionary idea, if their response to shows of opposition, whether it's people staying home or people going to the polls but not voting the way they expect them to, um, if their response to that is to crack down further, what does the opposition do then? Well, if they go on uh, with cracking down mm -hmm. further, as you say, I think uh, the, um, how to say, the tension inside the country will get worse and worse. 
and uh, in the end it will end up dramatically for everyone and for their position and for the powers because revolutions in Russia are very bloody as we know from our history and it always gives a very negative collapse in the end so no one is actually interested in this kind of uh, um, evolvement of the situation so I think it's a bad choice for both parties and both understand this. So my last question, um, you were recently in Grozny um, and uh, you were there in part, you were talking about the attacks on human rights defenders in the North Caucasus. Uh, should you actually win the presidency of Russia? Uh, what would be your North Caucasus policy and what would you do to protect human rights workers and victims uh, of human rights violations in that part of Russia? My visit to Grozny was once again an example of, uh, of a fact that Grozny, unfortunately, uh, is not Russia at the moment, de facto. Because, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure some of you are so deeply involved, but I had videos from Grozny when people bullied me on the street. I mean, yeah, merely no. attacking. Uh, just being there on the country, so they said, "Go home, don't come to our uh, to our region," and things like this, and saying really bad, bad words to me on the streets, and it was an atmosphere of shock and fear. Uh, we went with a group of 15 uh, ladies from my campaign, uh, and you know there was such a shock with those men with covered faces coming on the street like more than 30 men and starting bull uh, bullying us. What it showed, it showed as an example that Chechnya lives by its own rules. And I don't think that idea of just giving money like uh, in Roman times they used to do with their colonies, just giving money and trying to rule this way, it will bring us to nothing, to no results. It will only make Ramzan Kadyrov richer and more aggressive. So uh, what I plan to change, and I have a huge program, uh, so to called federalism reform, mm -hmm. which is saying how to, first step is to make free elections in those regions. So we are a federal country uh, and everything cannot be ruled from Moscow. This is a bad trick because now the system is like this. Putin puts people to the regions. Some of the regions are having mocking elections, like they elect those people, but everyone knows it's Putin sent this person there and everyone votes because of this. And people are not interested in changes in their own regions. They're only interested in Putin accepting them. So the only simple thing we have to change is to give them freedom to elect. And if Chechen people on the free elections, which I really doubt, would choose Kadyrov, okay, it's their right. But now they don't have this choice. They're all frightened, they're all feared, and even people are feared to be against Kadyrov because they will be just killed. You know, it's not, uh, it's not elections in uh, Oklahoma somewhere, you know. It's like people get killed, they disappear, they, uh, this is what happens. Thank you. Okay, so I know there are a lot of questions in this audience, and I'm going to the woman um, with her hand up. Yeah, right. yeah, I actually please wait, oh, so please, uh, ground rules, please wait for the microphone. Please tell us who you are, and please do ask a question. And I will cut you off if you go on too long. Thank you. My name is Irina. And my question is, um, how well do you think you established your credibility with people? When you travel to regions and you talk to people, do you think people want these revo revolutionary changes that you're talking about? How, how do you see the reaction of the public? Thank, Thank you. you for the question. Uh, well, uh, this question should be divided into two. First of all, people do not support the idea of revolution in Russia in a big numbers, that's for sure. And this we see even now on the streets. People get frightened. They're against Putin, but they know that if they go on the streets, they will be bullied by police, they would be bullied, uh, put to prison, and they, this fear makes them stay at home. 
And this gives us very bad picture of that no one wants change. And, pa and our state powers are very, how to say, cunning on that. They created a situation when those uh, leaders of protest come out on the streets, like Alexei Navalny, not so many people uh, uh, are there on the streets because they're frightened, not because they don't share those ideas. But that gives a picture that you see it's just a mere minority. So yes, at the moment, people don't want those revolutionary acts. They don't want attack the police. They are not aggressive that much, but they really want change. They know that the situation is not right and it's not fair. So this is, I'm quite sure, if they opt for evolutionary way, most of their position would opt for this evolution way. The only problem that uh, we don't see any connection with the government who would say, okay, we will slowly but surely stop the perestroika process. We are not there yet. We have yet to convince them to stop this process. Another thing uh, is um, credibility with me and my audience. Of course, I'm only in the process of speaking up to them. They know me for many years as being on the first protests in Moscow on the 11th year, on the uh, 12th years when those protests started. I was one of the first figures, public figures to raise my voice and to say that I'm against what's going on in my country. So they know me already for many years. But also we have to understand that, you know, uh, Russian propagandistic TV works very much against me. You know, we are all joking with my uh, husband that all of a sudden, out of blue, after 10 years of my political journalistic career, they started popping up against some photos of 20 years ago, me being blonde girl on the covers of glossy magazines and having shows that I hosted as a, in, um, so to say, um, entertainment. entertainment TV shows. So I was like uh, blonde and young and I said look, to my husband, when I see now, they're only having these photos and I said, look, I will stay young forever. This is an <laughs> idea of eternal, you know, youngness because I don't look like that unfortunately anymore. I'm 20 years older, but they still, Ksenia Sobchak runs for presidency and, you know, 20 year girl with a corset. Okay, so this is how they work, but this is the, the situation we all live in. What we can do about this? Only talk, change, stay with my, with my people, go to different regions of Russia, which I do so much time now on my campaign. Okay. Um, please, right here. Thank you. Uh, Tatiana Vrashko, Voice of America. I have a question on Ukraine. So you outlined the policy on Ukraine in your program. You shared them with Ukrainian reporters. If you can repeat your main points of the policy regarding Crimea and Donbass for Washington audience. And this is the first part of my question. The second part of my question is, how do you see the conversation with Russian people about all the horrible things which were done to Ukraine, the, uh, the conversation about the compensation about the life lost, about the region destroyed. How important this dialogue for you with actually within Russia and how would you approach it? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, shortly about the points on Crimea and Donbass. First of all, I think all the support of the Donbass from the Russian side should be finished immediately. So all the forces that are there uh, pretending to be the uh, Bravolce volunteers. Volunteers should be removed from Donbass. Uh, and as soon as the support of Russia to Donbass will be ended, the conflict there will be ended. I'm quite sure in this. So it's only uh, artificially made conflict with, uh, with Russian uh, side. Uh, this is number one. About Crimea. Uh, we, uh, we really uh, broke the international treaty uh, on uh, taking the Crimea and making it part of Russia. 
But now we cannot solve the situation only by giving it back because it's really Russian people living there, two millions of Russian people that really support Crimea being a part of Russia. And we should take this in account. This is people who live there. And now to solve the situation, the only thing I see is an international referendum including all the people living in Ukraine and all the people living in Russia voting all together on the status of Crimea. And the three questions put to referendum there. Should Crimea be independent? Should Crimea be part of Russia? Should Crimea be part of Ukraine? Only this kind of international referendum with international worldwide vigilance of this referendum can be some sort of a compromise in this harsh situation we are now put ourselves into. Well, I think she. I think she answered that. I mean, she's. she's, she's, she's uh, yeah, yeah. But I answered that. That we broke the Budapest mm -hmm. Memorandum and we broke the treaty with Ukraine, uh, the peaceful treaty of ninety six of ninety seventh year. Uh, and yes, we did it. We broke it. We broke the law. But now, unfortunately, we cannot. It's not a badminton game, you know, Putin and Medvedev loves to play. It's, it's not like this, it's real people. You can't, okay, we took it, but now we will just, it's not a, a decision. Now let's do it in a fair way. Let's do an international referendum in both countries. So they themselves, the people of those countries, would decide how to deal with the situation further on. Okay, uh, right here in front, uh, please wait for the microphone. My name is Helena. Thank you for the opportunity to ask the question. Um, uh, Ksenia Anatolina, um, you spoke elo eloquently about the need to bridge the divide between different voices and fractions among the dissident movement, especially on the eve, um, in, in light of the upcoming uh, 2024 election. Now, um, recent opinion polls show that um, even though the number of Russians who would vote for either a male or a female candidate, uh, regardless of the sex, came up to about 50%, but still about 38% strongly feel that they would only support a male candidate. And the number of, um, of, of Russians... in the US? Or no, in Russian. Um, in the fall, October, <laughs> November. <laughs> so, and the number of, of Russian voters who would support a female candidate is at the historical low over the course of the last 17 years, and it's uh, at about 5% right now. So given those facts, what do you think is the duty of someone who is working towards the cohesion and unification of the democratic forces? Thank you. Well, I cannot change my gender. Well, I can, <laughs> but... <laughs> I didn't have this idea so far. Well, I didn't uh, you know, regard this option. Uh, but I can change the attitude. I can at least start changing it. And in Russia, especially, it's very important because we see what kind of uh, new rise of feminism we have now in America. And I'm really proud to see this. I was the one when I was watching the eighth mar uh, the, uh, the march, the um, march, uh, the march which was here, the women's march, mm -hmm. which took place not long ago. I was really like you can't imagine. I was looking at this, and uh, I was so much uh, enthusiastic. And I thought, well, maybe one day I will see something like this in Russia too because this is something that we really lack. And while I speak, I even you know, have this feeling uh, it's, it's so important uh, to bring those values as very important values into the minds of Russian women too. Because I totally understand that in a way we share very much of the so-called Asiatic cliches in Russia, because many women in Russia still think that the best happiness they can get is to get a good man uh, who have some money, who works, and who can bring up his family, and that's the happiness she only can dream about, the only happiness. Uh, women do not think of themselves, and this is very important, 
as always equal to men. Many women themselves don't think of themselves like this. And this is also a big problem. They don't want, uh, many of them don't want this kind of equality. They want to be uh, only with their men, th gaining money for the family and like this. We have to change that too. Because many women in Russia, young women, are different. They want to work, they uh, want to do their careers, they want to be on equal with men, but in such a conservative uh, environment, it's sometimes very difficult for women. And this is a huge problem in our country too now, and I want to change that. I want women to feel themselves equal in any respect to men, to understand that they can fight for those rights, they can rise up their voice, they can say what they feel is important, they can uh, make the same amount of money as men do. In Russia it's not like that. Uh, women in Russia get uh, approximately 30% less salary than men. Uh, many men, we have a huge sociology which I uh, watched about, that uh, men openly say that we want to hire men more than women. They just openly say it. And, you know, they are not even getting social offend after those words. So, of course, these things need to be changed. It takes time. And I know about those polls, and I know that many men, they feel that they don't want to be ruled by women in any case. They, f they feel this is some, something like, you know, cannot happen. But from the other side, Russia is one of the countries that has the biggest history of women ruling there. We had great Tsars that were women, Ekaterina the Great, Elizabeth, Ekaterina the First. So we have a huge tradition of uh, women's rule. So why not starting this subject right now? Why not raising this subject? And maybe my dream will come true and we will have this women's march one day in Russia. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> All right, um, right behind, uh, behind you. Uh, thank you for asking, uh, letting me ask a question. Ilya Zaslavsky, Free Russia Foundation. A uh, question about Magnitsky Act. Uh, you, you mentioned sanctions. Uh, Lyudmila Narasova, Senator, your mother, spoke at the uh, uh, Parliamentary Assembly of uh, OEC uh, in 2012, and she uh, criticized Magnitsky Act, saying that it punishes, there is a video of it, uh, that uh, it punishes not murderers, but some un, uh, unrelated people, that the, the real stumbling block is uh, for the investigation is that Bill Browder is not appearing before Russian investigators, and that it's actually an unlawful thing to do sanctions against gross human rights violators. So do you have any comments on that? And second, second question is uh, on, very quick. Uh, you mentioned politica, political and journalistic career. Uh, do you actually think that it's ethical to be a politician and journalist at the same time and change hats intermittently? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, first question. In Russia, uh, we have a very great author. His name is Turgenev. And he has a book, uh, a classical book. All the Russian children study it in, uh, in the school. It's called Fathers and Sons. It's a book about how different dif generations fight with each other because of their views, and that young people don't accept the views of their fathers sometimes. So my mother is a separate person, and many of the things she says and does, I don't approve it, even I love her as my mother. I don't know which video you are talking about, I just really didn't see it. But I can quite imagine that she could say something like this, because she's a senator, which I don't approve, and maybe you can watch my interview with her uh, on TV Rain, where I say it out publicly, that I don't like what you're doing, I think you're not doing it in the right way and you shouldn't do this. And this is my position. Yes, this is quite hard, because I mean, she's, she's a close person to me, but I really don't approve what she's doing, and the same I don't approve what Putin is doing. 
my family was connected with him uh, through my father in St. Petersburg. I was a little girl then, but my father used to work with Mr. Putin. But I still don't approve of what he's doing. And I think each of you had a situation in life when you had your relative or someone you know from your childhood, and then he says something, you know, really you can't agree with. She's a nasty woman or whatever. And you say, look, he's not my friend anymore. I mean, he's a nice guy, I know him, but his views, I can't share those views. Look, all of you had this, as I know, in your families, you know, this Trump situation, as I heard from uh, newspapers, divided families. So some people voted for Trump, others voted for Hillary, and relatives couldn't stand each other. Like, how could you say those things? The same we have in Russia, too. We have different views. And I don't share the views on my mother on this subject, and I said it many times openly. About journalism ethics, of course, I don't think it's ethical to be journalist and politician at the same time. That's why I stopped my journalistic career. I don't work on TV Rain anymore as a journalist. And the only ethical point, maybe to which you ask this question, was a press conference of Putin, where I really accredited, was accredited as a journalist to ask Mr. Putin question about not accepting Navalny to go to the elections, which I thought was very important, very crucial at this moment. But this happens because we live in such an absurd situation where I cannot debate with Putin being a candidate because he's just not going to debate. Can you imagine the situation? You know, we have elections where the main candidate just refuses to go to debates. And to me, being a journalist in my past, debates is the main mechanism where people can see the positions of different candidates. We don't have this ability in Russia. The only thing we have is a huge press conference where all the questions from many federal channels are very well known. Only a few people there are from independent press, and maybe they have an opportunity to ask a question. So for me, it was just the only opportunity. And as I already declared in my program, I will use any opportunity to go on and say in public what I really think is important for my country. Thank you. Um, go in back, um, the gentleman. Thank you. My name is Mike. I'm from Johns Hopkins. Um, I'd like to return to your answer on Crimea, which frankly was the only part of your otherwise inspiring performance that left me really disappointed. Look, the Russian Federation has three times the population of Ukraine. Even forgetting about the persecution of people who were against the illegal annexation, persecution of the Crimean Tatars, even forgetting about that, if one follows your logic with a three to one advantage in the Russian Federation, you know how the vote's gonna be. Let me just put it to you this way. I've, I've been trying to think of what a, a counterfactual would be. Suppose uh, the Chinese who are moving into the Far Eastern province peacefully as traders and marrying Russians and all that, suppose in a few years they decide that they're gonna make a grab on a relatively small part of the Far Eastern uh, maritime province. And then they pump in money to develop it and then they uh, meanwhile persecute the people who are against the illegal land grab. Would you be in favor of a situation where you then have a referendum in the Russian Federation and in China to see if the people who are people, uh, oh, and incidentally, they would have had a claim according to uh, the uh, Nerechen's treaty, uh, treaty of 1683. So the parallel with 1954 is even there. Would you be in favor of, I mean, doesn't that strike you as a little silly when you think about it? Thank you for your question. Um, look. I don't think it's a good example because uh, Crimea, maybe you just don't know that, but historically it was a part of Russia. Crimea was Russia for many, many years since the Catherine the Great. So it's not China coming for some territory, you know. We should understand that Crimea was part of Russia for many, many centuries. Then during the collapse of Soviet Union, we agreed that this part of territory would belong to Ukraine, but 
it was still Russian population, Russian people, not Ukrainians, living there. So it was a treaty signed between our countries, but within this treaty, Russian, it was still huge uh, Russian population living there. So then we divided like this. Then uh, all those Maidan revolutions in Ukraine started. We became an aggressor and did what Russia did, which I don't support. And I think that was a wrong doing. I think we did something wrong. And this, I must say, maybe also you don't understand. For Russians, it's a boo act. When I say in a Russian auditory, R R Crimea, by international law, is Ukrainian, everyone starts booing because like, this is really not a fake poll. 90% of Russians agree and like the idea that the Crimea is Russian. This we should also understand. And people in Crimea, they like the idea of being part of Russia. As a journalist with my colleague who is also here, he is uh, uh, a witness of that. As journalists, we went to Crimea to make a reportage on what's going on during the elections and stating that there were uh, many military Russian people, so-called green, um, uh, green men from Russia who were not militants de facto, but they were. At the same time, we had to say as journalists, as doing this report, that people really supported that. Many, many Russians put to their windows the stickers, we want to be part of Russia, because they are R Russians and, and not Ukrainians. And in this conflict, they wanted to be with Russia. So now we cannot just you know, bring them back. It's not a decision. It's, it's, uh, it's not a, a compromise. A compromise is a referendum of both countries. This is the only compromise we can think of in a bad situation. If you ask me if we did the right thing, of course, no. I would never do that if I would be a president at the moment, but I was not. So the only thing we can do now is do something with this messed up situation. And we can't just solve it, but okay, bye bye, go back to Ukraine. This is, this is something you cannot do with real people, with two million Russians living there and wanting to be a part of Russia or wanting independence. So in, in uh, bad situations, we should find compromise. My offering is this compromise. If you think of a better compromise, then let's discuss. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's go right here. Okay. I'll cut you. Thanks. Kesa Buglin, Swedish Radio. I have two questions. First, um, speak about I am curious about what you think your father would have uh, thought about Putin today. And the other question is, since it's so disputed in this country, to what extent do you think that Russia influenced the American election? <laughs> oh, so about Putin, uh, what can I say? I said it thousands of times, but I'm eager to repeat. I think he created an authoritarian system in Russia, uh, which uh, destroyed independent court, which is the most uh, the most deadly thing that was done to my country because now we don't have independent court in Russia. And this is a, a, a huge tragedy, tragedy for the whole country. People in Russia know that, you know, whatever happens, you cannot go to court. You will never get justice there. And actually, this also gives, uh, so to say, a bad lavushka, um, I don't know, trap. a trap for Putin because you know, he's 18 years ruling the country. I really think he's tired of that. He would love to go to Sochi and stay there with beautiful women and wine and all those things. But he cannot because he created a system where there is no independent court. And he knows that as he calls and says, bring to prison Khodorkovsky, okay? Let out of the prison Navalny. The same any person on his place would call and say something about him. And he knows that, and that's why he cannot leave. So he's the one who is in charge of all those bad changes in, in Russia, which I do not support. 
So we have to change the situation, but we have to change it in this way so he doesn't feel that he will go to jail himself because otherwise he will never leave and he has all the money, all the powers, and he will stay there forever if he doesn't have this idea of smooth evolutionary way of changing things. So this is what my idea comes after because if we always say about like uh, how we will you know go and put him to prison then we will only make tension stronger and he will never leave he will stay there forever and this is what i don't want because you know he steals the times of our lives and i don't want that to happen so this is to answer your first question about um the situation that happened with the uh, russian uh, how to say, um, uh, 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 meddling. We, meddling, we, we, yeah, we yeah, Russian, meddling. Russian meddling uh, into elections. Well, what can I say? I'm, I'm not in charge of that, but I'm sorry if that really happened. That's not <laughs> should, what should a country like Russia do, and no country should interfere into the situation. But I think that in reality, it doesn't have a lot to do with Russia or Putin. It's just a way of solving things with Trump here, as far as I see it. It's just a kind of, you know, uh, a game, a, a, pol a political game uh, against or for Trump. So, well, I don't know if it happened or not. By the facts I, I, I see here, you know, we, we see a lot of interrogation. It did happen, but I'm really sorry if it's like that. I'm a Russian person. Well, I can only say I'm sorry. <laughs> but it was not me, myself, this right. I can assure. Uh, so the gentleman uh, behind you, sir, the gentleman. Yeah, you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Wei. I'm a, a, a Chinese who lived in this country for many years. And the first, uh, I want to ask you a question. What's your take on the Sino-Russian relations? And uh, is it possible for we, our two great countries to form an alliance, a strategic alliance in the face of American aggression? Because recently, the, State, the Department of Defense just announced Russia and China are the main competitor, and even though even enemies to American influence around the world. My second question is, why the Russian liberal class has such hostility toward we Chinese? As we know, which China has already become the largest investor, the largest trading partner of Russia. I mean, I'm very happy to see uh, um, President Xi Jinping and, uh, our, and uh, Putin met many times. And um, your President Putin is very popular in China. And uh, we call him Putin the Great. And also, Ms. Putin has bought many ice cream to China, sure. and the Russian ice cream is okay. very popular think, in China. Uh, I, th I think she's got the questions. And so I also want to know... Well, I think you, I, you've, got, you've asked several questions. They're good questions. I think we'll let Ms. Subchak okay. answer them. <laughs> well, I didn't get actually all of that. I'm sorry for my English because, uh, you know, it's... Um, alliance between... Prospects for alliance mm -hmm. between Russia yeah. and China in the face yeah. of American aggression, and why does the Russian middle class hate the Chinese? I think we can okay. leave it with that. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, yes. first, well, is popular first. In China, but actually, this important. was my point yeah. because well, I have Putin's a lot of meetings here. And that actually uh, is my point that I wanted to make on some other meeting, but I'm eager to share it now, too. The, there is actually a point in what uh, uh, you were making about um, this connection with Putin against anti Americanism. Uh, one thing you should understand, that by, by putting more and more sanctions on Russia, pressing harder on Putin, not someone, but also you in America and you in Europe make Putin a leader of anti-Americanism movement in the world. And this is not good at all. And this question you ask is actually, you know, this is a huge position all around the world. Many countries I come to as a journalist, people say, yes, we support Putin. I said, why? How the hell can you support Putin living, I don't know, in Italy, somewhere in the province or in China? or so? Because he's anti-American. He's a leader of anti-American movement. And this is how Americans make him feel. 
It's not us who think of him like that. But by pressing him, by making him a hero, uh, suppressing those sanctions and fighting with those sanctions, many other countries, uh, countries, uh, uh, Developing world. Developing countries, big countries, they're uniting with Putin because he, they feel his strength and they, are, they have anti-American attitudes and you only make his power bigger. And this also is a very important case I want everyone to understand here in America. So I don't want this to happen and I don't like this idea. And I don't think we should fight <laughs> with America, I think we should be part, we Russians, we are part of European civilization. We are the biggest European country and this is who we are. And here I think there is a difference with the Chinese way. Your economy is very strong, you have another way of developing, but we are different in, in this respect, which is not bad. We can still have uh, connections, we can have economical alliances, but we are just different in our perspective and movement towards other countries. About second case. I wouldn't say middle class people uh, hate China, China people. It's not true. What I can say which is true, uh, you know what is the most um, fashionable and up to date way of bringing children in big cities in Russia now? All my friends who have children, even I'm starting thinking about this for my little child too, are searching for good Chinese um, teachers, because they all want their children to study Chinese. Why? Because they say, you know, there is a huge opportunity that one day, you know, some people in Russia would need Chinese language, because, you know, Chinese uh, is a big country on the borders of Russia. Many Chinese people with time can come in, to Russia in these or other ways. So this is a, a, a reality in which we live in. Everyone wants to learn Chinese. Everyone knows that one time it's a joke, but still people joke with each other, you know. What can happen? I have a little baby, but maybe in the time he will grow up, we will be a part of China. So let him study Chinese right now. So you should understand this is the reality we live in. So no hatred, it's just the reality. You're huge, you're strong, you're economically very strong. And of course, with such a huge population on our borders, where we have a very small population in Siberia, there are some threats that many Russians think about. This is just fact. Okay. Um, over there, Toby. Uh, behind, uh, behind the gentleman. Uh, yeah, sorry. Hi, uh, my name is. Up. You can be next. <laughs> Would you like to say yeah. Actually, not. Yeah. No, Hi, actually, Peter Semler with uh, Capital you. Intelligence. I was with your but father in the August do? coup That's in fine. Leningrad, <laughs> um, and I saw him liberate he, the, the freedom of the Baltics. That was decided between Boris Yeltsin. And, you know, President Putin was first began as an uh, office manager for a U.S. law firm in Leningrad, uh, Shapira Dickstein. He became the international relations of uh, the city of Leningrad, and then he became your father's deputy mayor. And then we know the economic recovery. Are you going to use your campaign to remind Putin how far backwards he came from his start, from being on the right side of the coup against the KGB, the freedom of Russia, and then you know, bringing the economic miracle, getting Russia out of its economic disaster under Yeltsin, he brought the economy back, he liberalized, he was a liberal, he was a Democrat, and now we come to this point where we're facing a lot of things that are in trouble. You know, the regions are hurting, there's no jobs, uh, you've lost a trillion dollars or so far in GDP because of the sanctions. Is this going to be your message to the President Putin during your campaign? Exactly. I just word in word repeating one of my presidential campaign uh, videos. So this is what actually I'm going to say, that he really uh, changed uh, to, uh, to, to, to worse the situation in Russia, and that he really started like being with, demo with real Democrats in the 90s, uh, choosing his way with democratic leaders, but then during those years he brings us back to Soviet Union. 
this is what he does. And in this way, he just, you know, all the values that were important in the 90s for my father and for people who were at that time, you know, the, the people who changed the situation in Russia. He, he has no, he, he changed his values. Uh, and this is unacceptable to me. And that's what, of course, I'm reminding the people when I'm talking about it. So you're absolutely right. I agree with you. Okay, so uh, if we could pass the microphone back to uh, third, well, third row actually was where I was going initially, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Toby Gotti. Um, I know you want to have a message of hope and of political change, but what I hear really is a message of patience, which is a very appealing characteristic sometimes, but sometimes not. Um, and the patience is to hand the country to Putin for six years. My question to you is, what do you think Russia's gonna look like in six years? What will be left to save of the opposition, of civil society, um, the decrease in education spending, healthcare, increase in corruption? So if the message is to wait, what are we waiting for? And is the message also to the international community that we should wait, or what should the international community be doing? Six years is a long time. I don't think um, that that's the kind of message that an electorate usually wants to hear. A lot can happen in six years. Thank you for the question. My message is definitely not to wait, but I'm just a realistic person about this. If we are not waiting, then what? Do we have millions of people on the streets, like it was in Arabic Spring, to, you know, uh, to, to withdraw the regime? No, we don't. I mean, uh, you can be impatient when you have powers to do this, but you can't be impatient when you have nothing to offer. Unfortunately, I, am, I live in Russia, I'm a realist, and Politics is an art of compromise, as you know. I don't want to wait. It's also my year, six years of my life. You know, I will be even further from those nice blonde pictures than I am now. But what can we do about this? We see around 2,000 people on the streets protesting. It's not enough to withdraw Putin. And, it, and the, it, this number is not sufficient. I was studying politology. We all know that the number on the streets to start the withdrawing process of revolution is around 200,000 people. This is where it all started. Before this number, if you see you know, different experiences of different authoritarian countries changing the regime, this is a number where a talk of revolution can start. 2,100 people on the street during past five years, we never got more than 25,000. This is a reality. We had a huge protest in the year 11th where I was there. It was around 150 people, 150,000 people on the streets. That was the hugest protest. But it was peaceful protest, which was not against, uh, it was not a revolutionary protest. It was that huge because it united the people who went out on the street from different, different uh, polars of political spectrum to come out and say, Putin, we want change. It was not about like, Putin, we will kill you, or Putin, we want to withdraw you. This in the 11th year was Putin, we want change, we want uh, perestroika. It didn't work out. Everything was even more tight after those times. But it never reached this number all those five years. So my year, uh, my uh, message is not to wait, but we don't have an alternative now. The only way we can try to solve the situation is to go and influence the politics from inside, from creating our own power, which will be not marginalized to stay on the street, but which will be in parliament, which will be speaking out loud to the world, which you can't just, you know, ignore like they do with other oppositions. So this is just another way of trying to solve the situation. But what 
can, uh, what can you offer if you say, we don't want to wait? I don't want to wait too, but you can't make revolution with 2,000 people on the street. You can't really change the situation like this. And the sanctions, they make the situation bad for some of the people who have their money abroad. But it won't kill the economy. Economy in, in Russia now is not the economy of Soviet Union. It's stronger. And, you know, it's not going really good, but it's not going to collapse. And all the analysts of the economical situation in Russia, they share this point of view. They see stagnation for a long period of time, maybe for 10 years more time, but stagnation is not a collapse. With this kind of stagnation, as I explained in what I have wrote, people would leave because they remember the 90s years, and that was the worst years for them. And they were as poor as, the, as they have never been before. So compared to the 90s, which all those people remember, they live much better now. And even when the situation after 2008 diminished, it, it is still much better than it was then. So they are okay with this. They, that's why they go and vote for Putin, because for them, he's still a, a guy who made their life better, which is not true, because it's oil prices which made our life better. But you know, you can't explain it to people. What they see is that Yeltsin and your democratic leaders, they collapsed a country, and you say it's not they who collapsed, it's Soviet Union which collapsed. They, they were just on the ruins of the country, which was so badly economically managed. But people don't understand that. Propaganda works on, on those grounds, as I explained. This is our 90s, these were Democrats, these were liberal guys, remember what they did. And now we have strong power, but look how you live. Your life is much better, so decide for yourself. And we, opposition, have to fight with this image, with this cliche, which is so deep, deeply put into our people. And this is a, a huge tragedy for all of my country. Okay. Go to that side of the room, um, uh, in the back, far end. Hi there, I'm Aaron Schwartzbaum. Um, so you've talked about touring the regions, um, and I think one of the issues the opposition has faced in Russia historically is making inroads beyond St. Petersburg and Moscow. So I'd be curious to hear, what is your message to voters in, say, like Nizhny Tagil, the smaller industrial city? What, is, what are you offering? What's, what would be different from what uh, Putin and the current administration has offered? I visited um, more than 18 different regions of Russia, and I will still be traveling in two days when I come back. So it's really a lot. I've, seen, I've been in Siberia, on Ural, in different parts of my huge country. Of course, the main problem there is different from Moscow or big cities. The main problem is poverty there. This is what they want to solve. And this is what they want you to speak about. They want to sh solve poverty, but they don't see the connection between poverty and the corruption uh, of the system and uh, the corruption of the people who are ruling the country. So my goal there is to explain this, uh, this link, to say to them that your poverty is connected with uh, having no real elections, because people who rule in your small city and stealing money that they get, uh, they are not interested in your votes, because they know that they are appointed from Moscow, and they're only interested in showing result for Putin on his elections. If they show good result for Putin, then they will stay there, and it doesn't matter even if they steal something. So my work is really hard one. I have to explain, go to those people who are saying, look, my house uh, has, I don't know, has uh, bad walls or it's ruining and uh, it's cold inside my house. I have to tell them this connection because without understanding how the system works, we will never change it. And of course, this is very difficult because for them, the main problem is why I live in a cold house why I don't have enough money to feed my family. And this is, this is what, what I'm doing every day when I'm traveling. A okay. uh, gentleman right here. Oleg, Oleg Mirkulov, <coughs> Business of Baltimore Media Group from Riga, Latvia. 
Would you take into consideration the concerns of Russian language minorities living in Baltic states if you become president and start forming uh, the foreign policy towards your neighbors? Uh, specifically in Latvia, the concerns are the attempts of Latvian government to transform uh, existing Russian language schools into 100% Latvian language schools, then the issue of citizenship, and uh, so-called uh, 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 center of state language. This is like a language inspection, which go, goes around and issues fines and punishments for even private businesses. Thank you. You mean my minorities uh, of... Нужно ли сохранять язык, правильно? Что, что делать? Well, well, of course, we have to have those links with uh, Russian minorities all over the post-Soviet regions. That's very important. But we also have to respect it's another country and uh, having good relations with those other countries that were once a part of Soviet Union. This is something very important in international politics of Russia, and this is what I think is the best way. So, for example, I think we would never have those troubles with Ukraine if we had good relationships uh, with them, uh, which would be a priority of our policy, which was not. We were just thinking of them as, okay, we give them good money for gas, we put some leaders there even if they don't like them, but it's not creating collections, it's not creating cultural links, you know, centers uh, which would embody both countries. And this should be a cornerstone of our international politics. Because, you know, our propaganda uh, uses to say, I really like this idea, say, you know, Americans, put millions of money officially into Ukrainian uh, country by doing some centers of education, by inviting Ukrainian students to some centers in America. And I said, okay, look, this is their policy and they have a right to, you know, to fight for their interests in this legal way, in, in inviting students and creating cultural centers, why Russia, being the closest alien to Ukraine, didn't do something like this? Why we didn't have a huge problem with millions of money, not for corrupting uh, people, uh, closest friends to Putin, but why those millions didn't go on creating cultural links with Ukraine, on creating, you know, uh, students coming to Russia and doing big programs on uh, making us unite, which is also a legal point of thing, but no one did it, because we don't just think about things like this until something bad is happening in the country which is close to us. So my number one priority is cultural and educational links with all the countries that were once Soviet Union. This is uh, the only chance to have good relations, to support minority living in those countries, and you know, to, to avoid uh, collapses that we saw, for example, in Ukraine. Okay, we have time for one last question. Um, and I'm gonna give it to the lady standing in the back uh, who has been very patient. Tanya Nyberg, uh, Magnitsky Act Initiative. Uh, I myself will not participate in the, the so-called elections and uh, I would like to ask you uh, what, uh, under what conditions would you join uh, the boycott uh, to which uh, Alexei Navalny called for? Thank you for your question. I won't join the boycott because I don't think uh, this will work out. I don't think it's an effective way. And I spoke with Alexei before making my decision to go to those campaign, right, because I thought it's not gonna be effective. And we actually discussed with him his way of doing things and that I don't agree with this way of doing things. Because you can't be effective in staying at home. 
This is what I really think. You can't be effective in, in boycotting the election when you don't have a minimum of uh, people going to elections. Yavka, I don't know the... Yeah, yeah. How? Turn, turn out. out. Turn yeah. out. In Russian legislatory on elections, we don't have a minimum uh, turn out, uh, turnaround. And this is a huge problem because, you know, you can respect Alexei, which I really do, for what he does, but, you, uh, but at the same time, me, I cannot, um, you should respect mathematics. Boycott is mathematically not effective way of doing things. Because by Russian law, even if three people come to the elections, they will be considered legitimate. But then, if opposition does not come to the election, the most of the percentage of those votes for Putin will be bigger for Putin than if someone comes to opposition. So it's just maths. You can't be against mathematics. If opposition does not come to the elections, Putin will get more votes. That's a fact. So what we do, we show that he has more votes. This is what we want. We want him to go out and say, I got 75% of all the people who came to the elections. This is what will happen if we don't come. If we will all come and vote for the oppositionary candidate, he will have less a percent out of all people coming to the elections. Excuse me, two plus two is four. It can't be six even if we all love and support Alexei Navalny. So that's why I go to the elections. Okay. All right. Uh, Ksenia Sobchak, I um, am really grateful to you for joining us. I think that is um, a note to end on that reflects, I think, your positions very, very well. I'd like to thank our audience also for being here and asking such good questions. Before we all uh, join in applauding Ms. Sobchak, I would like to note um, any press, uh, please talk to Ms. Sobchak's team, which is sitting here in the front. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>